quite a stream today guys so just get on ready prepare yourself grab some water it's gonna be a lot p.s isn't that cup like the prettiest thing you've ever seen in your life Ugh. okay today we are reviewing the cecil hotel netflix documentary series that everybody's been dying for me to review um yeah there's a lot going on um a lot of things i actually didn't know about um, so we're just going to start off, first of all, let's do a little bit of, of housekeeping, shall we? Like I'm going to step up on my soapbox for just a minute. I did a chat with Kat on the podcast a couple of weeks ago regarding uh, females in paranormal and females in film and the struggle that we've had um, trying to get the series signed and everything else. So there's uh, been a couple of comments, uh, more than more than one, which is why I'm addressing it. And... Um, the questions are, uh, am I mad at Zach? Is Zach mad at me? Let's address it. First, the first question is, it, am I mad at Zach for not viewing the pilot? No, mm -mm. not even in the slightest. Like, I have no idea what was going on in his personal life at that time or now or any time. Um, maybe he didn't have time to view it. I'm not mad about it at all. Not at all. Um... I've just had so many people bugging me to like get him involved and I just wanted to let people know that I tried. Um, am I mad? No, I'm not mad. I, I was never mad about that. Number two, am I mad at Zach for taking the idea of booze and reviews and re-implementing it into Screaming Room? Why? Why would I be mad? Like just because I talked about it doesn't mean I'm mad. Produ like that's my fault for I forget, like, I think people think like filmmakers and filmmakers are known, especially producers, for like swapping ideas and like collaborating. Like, I'm not in the professional industry in Los Angeles anymore, but my friends that are producers still call me to ask me for advice. Hey, Crystal, I'm working on set doing this. Hey, Crystal, I'm a field producer doing this. Can I have some ideas? Can we throw some things and bounce some things off of each other? Absolutely. So that's like a, a, a known fact that like producers collaborate and mesh ideas. So no, I'm not upset that if that was the case. I don't know for a fact if he took the idea from me. I was doing booze and reviews about a year, we've done the math, um, about a year prior to when Screaming Room came out. If he just happened to come up with the same idea I did, wow, our brains are like scarily alike. Um, and that could also be the case. There was anything I was upset was that he just couldn't communicate with me and just be like, hey, really like the booze interviews. I think I'm going to re-implement that. Is that cool? Of course I would have been like, yeah, like that's what producers do. Like it's a, it's a mutual respect that you should have for each other, which I absolutely have respect for Zach, and he absolutely has respect for me, 100%, I know that. So if there was anything that I was ever mad about, it was lack of communication. It wasn't the fact that he like took the idea, which by the way, I don't know if that actually happened. Um, if it didn't happen, we think way too much alike, and that's very scary. Um, with that being said, people are saying, well, maybe Zach's mad at you because you accused him of taking the idea of um, booze and reviews and implementing it into Screaming Room. Do you guys really take Zach for being that much of a squish ball? Do you really think he lets feelings get in the way? He's an executive producer of a top tier show on Travel Channel under the Discovery umbrella. You think his feelings get hurt? Feelings and emotions don't make money. Ideas do. Okay, so let's just get that straight. Um, do I think he's mad at me? No. If he's mad at me, Zach, I'm sorry. I really am. Like, I'm not, I was not trying to start beef. I've never wanted to start beef. People knew that I unfollowed him and removed him from social media. Um, I didn't want to become a burden in his life, his personal life, his professional life. Um, communication, once again, shut down completely with him. It was never personal. It was never a personal issue. 
I don't want you guys are like turning this into something that it's not. I'm not mad. No, I am not mad at him. If I hurt his feelings, I am sorry. Is he mad at me? I'm like 99% sure he's not mad at me. Um, would it have been nice for him to give me a courtesy call and like have a chat? Take me to coffee, take me to dinner? It would have been great. That would have been fantastic. That's the proper thing to do as producers collaborating, taking ideas. You don't really steal ideas. You can't copyright ideas. That doesn't happen in, in the film industry. And I forget to explain that because I went to film school. Zach went to film school. He went to documentary school. I went to actual film school. What I'm trying to say is Stanley Kubrick is a director that I studied. And Stanley Kubrick has a famous quote that he said, which was, there are, new, there are no new ideas in film. All ideas have been done. Everything has been done, but it is your job as a director to do it better. So if I were to take booze and reviews and Zach is to take Screaming Room, we are two directors, two executive producers, and they're gonna come out completely different. Why? Because his brain works differently creatively than my brain, which is why booze and reviews was not the same as Screaming Room. It was completely two different ideas. He took it and, and went a different direction. Am I mad about it? Why? Why would I be mad? The only thing I've ever been upset with him about is lack of communication. That's the only thing I've been upset about. Other than that, like once again, I would love to have him back in my life, but that's gonna have to be a door that he opens um, because um, I was felt like I was, I shouldn't be in his life. So long story short is, I hope that makes it clear, but let's not stir thing, let's not stir the pot and make it something that it's not because I have always been transparent with you guys. Zach is not a squish ball. He is a millionaire. He works his ass off. He has one of the top tier shows. His feelings don't get hurt. Feelings don't make money. Ideas do. True crime case of the century. Elisa, Eliza, Lamb, I don't know. Also, I heard Cecil, Cecil both pronounced different ways. So I don't really think there is a way to pronounce it. I have people that I know that live in Los Angeles. They pronounce it both ways, people. Potato, potato, tomato, tomato. Let's call the whole thing off, okay? Like everybody chill. Like, you know, people pronounce things differently. There is, there's no right way, okay? Um, cinematography was amazing. First thing, like right off the bat. Cinematography was beautiful. Netflix is known for um, doing top tier cinematography. A lot of people said, Crystal, why did you change? and you decided not um, to not to manifest a series on Netflix the main reason is they always cancel their series after like Sabrina after three or four seasons and that's because they can't afford to keep going Netflix needs to have commercials because commercials are what pay for film people get annoyed with that people say oh like don't put commercials on Netflix they need it guys or they're not gonna be able to afford it Netflix if they had like Johnson & Johnson toilet paper ads running you would see 20 seasons of Sabrina. They do not have the financial means to keep up the way that they're filming. They have to change something. I hope they put commercials in because they need to so that we can see our favorite shows go longer and longer. Commercials are what pay for film. That is the sponsorship and the bread and butter of film. Why don't I wanna to go to Netflix? Because I don't wanna be canceled after the third or fourth season because they can't afford it. They're saying that there's prostitutes, rapists, murders, drug dealers, serial killers, psychopaths, mentally ill that stay at the Cecil Hotel. They're saying she was sort of an insect that was caught in a trap and there was like violence crime that was going on and there's always sort of like spookiness around the whole Cecil, including obviously, um, you know, Skid Row, which by the way, I didn't realize it was that big. So now one thing I didn't know was that her Tumblr account was still active. I have linked it down below in the description. I encourage you to go to her Tumblr account and poke around. I did for a while. Another thing that was very surprising to me was how intelligent Elisa was. It sounds horrible to say, but I really feel like uh, women in general, especially women of color, when they go missing or like they're a murder suspect or like something's going on, they tend to portray women of color um, dumber than white women. I know I'm white passing, but I'm Native American and I've always stood for my heritage and my background and especially my bloodline. And I really feel like looking back the time of her disappearance, they made her look to, like she was this exchange student, foreign exchange student from China who couldn't speak English. And then seeing her Tumblr and how eloquent she was with her words, that wasn't the case at all. And I hate that the media does that with women of color. Like Native American women go missing by the handfuls and there never is media coverage on it and it makes me sick. 
and the tribes are always trying to do something about it and nothing happens because they're women of color. And I think this is the same sort of case that we're seeing and it's not fair because when I was listening to them talk about quotes from her Tumblr page and then I went and poked around on her Tumblr page, I was so impressed with just how intelligent she actually was. So she was going to the West Coast to tour for basically her first home away from home uh, vacation by herself. Um, 18 detectives total actually responded to her case as a missing person and apparently I was also interested to find out that mostly foreign guests are who stay at the Cecil. Now all of a sudden comes in this manager, Amy Price. She says that she was the manager from 2007 to 2017, so for 10 years and she was the general manager at the time while um, Eliza went missing. She's this white blonde woman, very stern face. Um, she kept repeating, it's my kingdom, and she has this really weird laughter behind it, and I just couldn't understand the vibe I got from her. It was like, I just didn't trust her. Um, she seemed sketched to me. So Eliza checked in on January 28th, 2013. She was supposed to stay there for four days. Um, she was staying in room 506, which is like a communal room, and apparently these girls were like complaining. She was doing weird things like leaving notes on their beds and on the door, so they asked to have her removed. So then after that, they made her go to a solo room, but there was like a community toilet, and, and it's built like a hostel, so that's interesting. February 1st, she was supposed to check out, and that's the day she was reported missing. Now, the hotel staff removed her belongings, and Amy Price kept saying that was protocol. I don't know, man. I feel like that's just a disaster waiting to happen and I feel like it would be a really big red flag if somebody, if you walk into a hotel room and someone's full belongings are still there and that maybe you should call police and report it. Um, I know that at the Stanley Hotel that's how they handle things. It's also a much nicer place than the Cecil. but I didn't agree with her saying that was protocol. I think that was wrong and I just immediately got the vibe that she was hiding something. Why else would you go in and completely clear out somebody's room when they've been you know, reported as a missing person? She says, we wanted to help every step of the way with the police, yet they removed the belongings. So did ya? I mean, literally guys, her laptop was there, prescriptions, her clothes, wallet. Wouldn't you see that as a red flag? Something's wrong, someone leaves their wallet or their purse behind? and they just cleaned it up and got the room ready for the next person, really big red flag to me. They didn't take a picture of what the room looked like while it was like, you know, unpacked. However, she said it was disarray, but it was messy, not foul play. She's the only one that can determine that because they're the ones that saw it. The police didn't even get to see it. Who knows if there was evidence in there that had been wiped clean. She said there were no drugs and there was no foul play. How can she determine that? How could she determine that? Now, Q and Mike and Sabrina, which are these English couple that comes over from the UK, um, they called the Cecil dirty and ghetto. And they said that the walking on the carpet was sticky and they'd have to peel their feet off of the carpet. Reminds me of Circus Circus downtown. Don't ever stay at Circus Circus. It's very cheap. It's like $19 a night, sometimes less. During the pandemic, they got really desperate and started charging like $11 per room. There's a lot of crime that takes place there. Um, and I've, I stayed there once just because I was curious. That was before I moved to Vegas. And there was blood on the on the walls of the bathroom and there was poo on the toilet, like wiped across the toilet. And I went down and complained to the front desk twice. And they were like, oh, we'll just get you another room. And I was like, but the third time is gonna be the same thing. Like you've already switched me rooms twice. So I ended up leaving the hotel. Um, another hotel you don't wanna stay at when you come to Vegas is the Wynn and the Encore. Uh, it is one of my favorite hotels. It's freaking gorgeous inside both of those. However, it is known for human trafficking, and it's also known to be the highest um, hotel on the Strip that uh, you will get drugged inside of the like uh, clubs that they have. Excess is amazing. I'm not saying not to go to the clubs because Excess is beautiful. It's probably one of the most beautiful clubs I've been to in Vegas. But if you don't watch your drink and watch what you're doing, people drug people and they will take you up to the room and you'll be knocked out and you'll wake up with a note next to the bathtub that your kidney has been taken out and you're in a bathtub of ice and to call 911 immediately. That happens all the time at the Wynn and at the Encore. Um, they're looking for foreign travelers that they can put um, organs on the black market. So 
I would just stay clear of those few places that I said. Also, the MGM is known for always having like horrible amounts of bed bugs. So any of the MGM places, I'm giving all the secrets away about Vegas. Okay, let's get back to the sticky carpet. Same thing as like, you know, circus circus. What would I do if I was in that case? I would request another room or I'd complain and I would request a voucher for another hotel. You can do that even if you don't have money. Um, you can request another voucher or you can request to like uh, report them to the Better Business Bureau. Um, I'm sure that there's other places you can report people to for something like this. Um, they ended up going out in downtown LA and they started walking around and that's when this British couple discovered Skid Row. Yeah, I don't think you should ever go downtown in downtown LA and just walk around. It shocks me because I think people, I think people see, I mean, I lived in Los Angeles, so I feel like I can, I can say something. I think people see Los Angeles, um, the Los Angeles that the media portrays, which is palm trees and the beach and like it's beautiful and it's perfect life. But if you don't go in the right areas, which um, are the safe areas, you're in really, really big trouble. So I would say um, anything south of Santa Monica Boulevard is probably not the safest. Chinatown is probably okay. Um, but you need to be really safe. Like you need to stay on like the Upper West Side. Um, the furthest east you wanna go would be like Burbank or like Pasadena sort of area. Where I lived was, um, I lived in Brentwood before, which is sort of like the Beverly Hills area. I also lived in <clears throat> Studio City, Brentwood. And I also had a loft um, in Santa Monica. But the beach area, particularly Santa Monica and Venice, especially Venice at night, um, can be really dangerous. So you don't want to hang out there at night by yourself. So I was never like living on the beach, but there are a lot of like robberies and like um, you can get held up and like your purse snatched and all that stuff. So please, I guess the biggest lesson is just study things and study locations before you just jump in and go. So they were saying that, um, and that's similar to Hollywood Boulevard. Like people go to Hollywood Boulevard at night and that's really, really dangerous. You don't wanna be down there like past eight o'clock when nightfall happens, like maybe even sooner than that. 50 employees were there when Eliza disappeared. Um, and then Cuban Santiago Lopez, who's this cute little Spanish speaking maintenance worker. He's an older gentleman. He's the one that witnessed um, her in the tank. Uh, they're also saying that she was always with a book. They saw Eliza with no guests per se, um, and she was always alone. Now another journalist named Josh Dean steps in and he's the one that starts detecting like what her Tumblr is saying and trying to like depict what's going on with her life and can we figure out where she is and what's going on. So she was clearly going out to meet strangers. She had some love interests. She wasn't really afraid to like be by herself. Um, and the bookstore, you know, she did visit the bookstore before she went missing. So they were trying to collaborate all of that stuff. That was called the last bookstore. A lot of people ask me if I've ever been there. That's a part of Los Angeles that I don't really go to often. Um, once again, you do not want to go south of Santa Monica Boulevard, honestly. Like, if I even go to, to Los Angeles, like Kat and I've been to LA a few times, or like if I go out there for work, or if I go out, whatever, um, and I have to get like an Airbnb or a hotel, like 90% of the time I stay in like West Hollywood usually, because that's very central, centralized to everything. Um, and I mean the hotel rooms aren't cheap like when I've when I've gotten a hotel in West Hollywood like you're looking at 100 to 120 a night and if you're looking at an Airbnb it can be like 140 to 160 a night um, No, it's not the cheapest but like you know, you're in a safer area and, and by the way West Hollywood isn't just safe either so you just need to be very mindful of of your locations when I look for hotels, I always make sure there's like a grocery store near or a convenience store or it's in the location where there's like a lot of people. You never want to be in a secluded place. And I feel like the Cecil is definitely more of a secluded location. Now, one of her quotes she said, and I'm quoting, said, my mouth is my downfall and it will get me in trouble. That was on her Tumblr account. So that was really interesting. That spoke out to me like very loudly. Uh, the Brits said they were walking down to Skid Row and they saw rows and rows of homeless people and they couldn't believe it. That's not a safe place to be. I didn't realize Skid Row was 56 rows long, had no idea. I have been to Skid Row before I've driven by. Um, I've had to attend court cases, not for myself, but for other people in downtown Los Angeles, which is near Skid Row. Um, I've driven by the Cecil Hotel, but I had no idea it was that big. They said there's over 8,000 to 10,000 people um, that have been living there for over 50 years, and that doesn't include the pandemic, which is crazy. That's where all the free resources are for if you're homeless. Um, they did interview this black gentleman that said he had lived on Skid Row for 21 years. He survived, and now he has 
um, gotten out of that. Thank God, good for him. Homeless um, assistance is on Skid Row, but any prisoners are just dropped off. People from mental facilities, um, the homeless are dropped off. Just doesn't matter. You, if you have nowhere to go, that's where you end up because you can legally pitch a tent and live there. It's always bared by police, they said. There's always police down there. There's always some sort of crime and activity. And it's described much like the wild, wild west. It's free to people to sleep on the streets, but that also comes with things like prostitutes, druggies, mental illness, and it's a place for people to suffer, is what they said. Um, lots of street crime, and you can get killed by walking down the street. If you're a woman, you can just get raped by walking down the street. So it's not a safe place to be. Now, they did have common areas um, with footage of Eliza, which is interesting. The detectives knew she never left the hotel. They just couldn't find out where she was. So it's interesting because the detectives came forward and said there's probably thousands of phone calls um, from the area per day and one to three calls per day from the Cecil alone. Why do they call 911? Things like burning it down, threats, domestic violence, drugs, regular fights, adult stabbings. There was a sniper in the hallway once. I'm sorry, let me say that again. There was a sniper in the hallway once. Creepy people, women saying that they're being spied on in the bathrooms, really strange stuff. 14 detectives went into the Cecil and they swept the entire thing, like 600 rooms. They said it was like a maze. The next thing the manager said, which was Amy Price, caught me off guard and it made me feel like she really didn't have any empathy. The police said, we need to search the dumpsters because maybe her body's in there. And the manager said, oh my God, you think she's in a dumpster? Bitch, have you never watched true crime before? Of course they could be in a dumpster. Like, that's the first place a serial killer puts a body. Don't act surprised. Like, you're, you're so fake, it's beyond fake at this point. Um, they said that the dogs located Eliza's scent near the uh, fifth floor westbound direction window near the fire escape. So they believe she went out the fire escape. But then you have the guy that comes in to do like the footage and like he compares the footage to try to find out where she was when she was last seen on tape. She was on the top floor, which is where you go to out the door to get onto the roof, and she was seen like in the elevator doing the weird thing. So I was like, hmm, okay, that's interesting. So if we're comparing footage, she wasn't on the fifth floor when she was last seen. Nobody ever saw her get back on the elevator and go back down. So how did she get out through the fire escape on the fifth floor? There's a lot of dots that like are not connected here. Now we cue to the elevator footage I didn't realize that it had been edited. As a professional video editor, I can tell you 100% that that video was edited. Um, the police are trying to say like, oh, if anybody did it, it was our staff. Why? Why? It's only 53 seconds. Why did you remove 53 seconds? I think it was edited by the hotel staff. They, they removed her belongings. Like there's just too many weird things going on. Too many disconnects. Um, also, originally Santiago said that when he found her body inside the water tank and then suddenly later when they went to court with Eliza's family, he changed his statements. Um, the manager says, I cared and I ran it properly. The maintenance manager said, we have a problem, but guests die in there all the time. Wow, what a cold thing to say, like no empathy whatsoever. I really got the vibe from her that she was more wanting to like save her own reputation and the reputation of the hotel versus like who cares who dies in there. It's just another dead body is like the vibe I got from her. So the maintenance manager says there's suicides and overdoses and murders constantly in the hotel. Um, she asked, is there a room someone hasn't died in? And she never responded. So I assume that that's a yes. So I think there's a lot more deaths that happen in there that we even know about. I don't, you know, we thought the like 20 crazy deaths of people falling out of windows were bad. I think there's more than that. I think there's way more than that. The elevator footage gets released, it goes viral. There's 80 tenants and they all pay $400 a month for low income housing. The new owners wanted to evict the tenants and then just turn it into an upscale hotel. However, um, they're basically saying you can't do that because there's some sort of agreement with Los Angeles County that it has to be monthly rentals for um, homeless people that need help to get on their feet. It's a program for Skid Row that individuals have for a home to try to get in a better place. The manager says that there's shady residents, bad things that just kept happening inside the hotel. There was constantly people that were passing away left and right. She says there's a, in 10 years there's about 80 deaths in the hotel. I don't know if I believe that. I think it's much more than that. Um, dark persona and tells that um, it was a hotbed for death is essentially what's said. Former resident of the 80s um, says that you never want to go higher than sixth floor because that's death. That's murder. You can get robbed and they'll throw you out a window up there. It's well known for that type of crime, including serial killers, as we know for um, Jack and uh, as well as Richard Ramirez. Now, interesting, I also didn't know that Richard Ramirez, like I knew he changed his bloody clothes in the um, 
like alleyway of the Cecil. I did not know he walked up the stairs covered in like blood in his underwear. So that was an interesting fact I found out. So the manager now once again starts talking about, oh, we had all these bad reviews and I didn't think it was fair. So I decided to change the name because the, the bad reviews and we changed it to Stay On Main. We'll keep the Cecil for the tenants and the Stay On Main is for other people. So it's essentially two locations working out of one building. They'll have two separate lobbies, but the only thing is that we have to keep um, one elevator where everyone sh shares. There's 15 stories. The tenants will be on two and three. The Stay On Main will be four, five, and six. And the Cecil will be remaining from seven through 15. Once again, don't go past the sixth floor. There were two different lobbies in one building and she said it was basically a band-aid for income. But the Stay On Main was different and it gave them a fresh start. Now back to the video, why do I think it was edited? The time freezes at the bottom, you see it like glitch out, which is clearly edited. You also see the elevator go to close and it like glitches out. Uh, yeah, that's definitely edited 100% do I think there was a foot that was outside of the door on the left side? Yes, I do do I think it was paranormal? No, I don't I think it was a person I think there was a person she was hiding from I think she was panicking trying to get out of the elevator Yes, she did hit open, but maybe she didn't realize she hit open and it stayed open for so long um, So it was really interesting to me um, Then she goes out and she's talking to something on the other side of the elevator, on the right side? I don't know. I I'm gonna get to like her bipolar here in a minute because you guys know I'm educated on bipolar. I know family members and people I've lived with with bipolar. So we'll get to that in a minute. So now going back to the um, British couple, they say there's brown water coming out of the tap. They're drinking it, they're brushing their teeth in it and they're showering in it. Why? Why are you tolerating that? Even if you don't have the money, you need to go down, threaten to Go after the business bureau or something. Google it. I know they're not from here, but Google, how do you like get out of a dirty hotel? You know, like there's gotta be information and forums on it. We all have smartphones at this point. It's just no no excuse. Um, they should have requested a voucher for another hotel with threatening to like, I don't know. Why, why would you do that? If I saw water, brown water coming out of a tank, even if I didn't have money to go somewhere else, I'd be livid and throwing a fit. Like I'd be throwing a fit so bad they'd want me out of the hotel. So I encourage you guys to do the same thing. There's a complaint about the water pressure from multiple tenants and that's when they decided to send Santiago up to see if there was some sort of a clog. He's the maintenance worker. He saw her floating, he said she was white as a ghost and she was face up. This is when he said originally the tank door was closed, which everyone was like, how is she gonna get out if the tank door is closed. She couldn't have jumped in and pulled the tank door shut, especially if they're saying it weighs like 20 pounds. Immediately, I thought someone did it, immediately. She also, Amy Price, the manager, said she advised the staff to immediately not talk to the media. She like locked them down on an NDA, and that's a big red flag. Big, big, big red flag. Something happened and somebody knows something. That's my opinion on it. Now, a lot of people started going down this dark hole. Now, I didn't know about the government conspiracy saying that maybe Eliza was a government agent. She was a biological weapon used to carry tuberculosis to infect people. I can't go, with, okay, that's QAnon and like incel stuff. And I can't go down that dark hole. You know, like I don't go that far. Like I won't go that route. Um, now the biological weapon, like I do see that people are getting that she was at the University of Columbia and like that they were seeing that. Now, the, now one conspiracy I can get on is the dark water movie from 2005, them comparing the little girl who's a Chinese girl wearing a red jacket, she's wearing a red hoodie. I see that comparison. Maybe someone, a, a staff worker who was up on that level with her in the elevator, um, the one that we saw like the foot, Maybe that person was um, had a sick fantasy. Maybe there's human trafficking going on there. We don't know. Maybe something went wrong and he had to kill her. She was only 110 pounds. They're saying, how could you how could you carry up a human on a ladder? If you're big enough and strong enough, 110 pounds is nothing. Literally nothing. My ex could bench my weight times two. So now people are saying like weird parallels. The bookstore. I don't know if it's like it's like the area code or something v5g4s2 and it leads to the same point of where her like grave mark is i know there's weird stuff i don't know i can't explain it i'm not going down this government conspiracy path i'm sorry i can't i can't get on that train um do i think that the cecil's haunted and evil 100 percent do i think it could have been paranormal related semi do i think there was a possession there could have been i can get on that i can get on that boat faster than i can get on 
one about a government conspiracy of her trying to infect people with TB. Now, the next thing is something that happened, which is with Morbid the Musician. And he was seen with Ted Bundy photos and Elizabeth Short, who's the Black Dahlia photos, in the background of him doing a video. He was at the Cecil one year prior to when um, Eliza was, and he got blamed for her death, saying he murdered her, it ruined his career. YouTube, like, nixed his YouTube account, his Gmail account was removed. This is the part of cancel culture I don't agree with. I don't agree with it. It's a witch hunt, and I don't think it's fair to some people. Um, unless, like, you know, pet files, like certain things, like, you know, Me Too movement, like people are raping people. Yeah, like, let's call them out, absolutely. As long as it's accurate. Like, they, these people online literally took thousands of people to puzzle this together with Morbid. This was the first time I've heard about it. And that's sad. He wasn't even in the country. He has proof. And now he tries to commit suicide, and he wakes up in a psych hospital. I mean, obviously, this has to be a part of his journey and why he's here on this planet. So I hope that he can flip it around and make it, make it somewhat good and like maybe be a voice for others that go through this. It's sad, though, because he thought he was put on this planet to have music. Um, and he does say something. Everyone has a shadow self. They have a secret self to hide from others. And he was just embracing the monster within. Doesn't mean he's a serial killer. And I do see where there were pellet parallels that some of the stuff he did was weird. But like, man, like that was, that was bad. Like people were so desperate to find somebody that could be held responsible for her death that they blamed the wrong person and his life literally got ruined. He almost lost his life to it. And he's right, like nobody's being held accountable for what he went through. He still hasn't gotten his YouTube account back. He hasn't gotten anything back. And then if he comes back out of the shadows, he's probably gonna have to have a total identity change so that he can make something of himself. That's horrible. He lost everything. It's not the way it should be. That is cancel culture that I do not agree with. Now, another piece of information I didn't know is that she was on set of some like live TV show. She wrote some sort of weird rambling long note to the host, demanded to see the host, and she was thrown out by the um, security staff. This was in Burbank. So that's interesting. I did not know about that. So now she was seen over the next few days coming down to the lobby making weird desk gestures, but she would leave. She was also known for being in locations that she shouldn't be that is like staff only. So she was sort of wandering around. The question was, does she not take her medicine? She was found naked with the lid closed, with her clothes, her autopsy says her clothes were covered in a sandy substance. Why didn't anybody talk about that on the, on the series? What was the sandy substance? Was it sand? Why was it covered in sand? Is there sand in the water tank? How is there sand in the water tank? Is it minerals? Like, you, I'm just, there's a lot of questions that they didn't really like completely cure while we were talking about this. Now they're saying like, you know, no marks, no foul play, low levels of medication, which was suspicious. Um, and it just says like she had inconsistencies with what happened. And there were sections that were crossed out. I've talked about the autopsy before. I think that that, um, they did have the coroner on they were interviewing him. My opinion of the coroner is he is arrogant and um, he is, uh, I don't know, you know, I can't imagine being a coroner in LA County. He probably has to do so many autopsies on people for weird crimes because so many people live in Los Angeles and I just feel like he's cold and doesn't care and he's arrogant and I, I think he was inconsistent. I think he's sloppy work. Honestly, looking at his stuff, I think somebody told him like, oh no, it needs to be put this way. We could get sued or the Cecil could get sued or something and they're from out of the country and we don't want to make Los Angeles look bad. Remember, LA is known for like tourism and like, oh, the beautiful city of LA and film life and celebrities and money and blah, blah, blah. We can't make it look bad by another tourist. So was there a motive? That could have been the motive right there. We can't have a foreign person come here and die or it's going to create a frenzy of fear where people don't come here and our economy will tank. That's a real fear that they have. So is that the reason they helped cover it up on the Cecil's part? I truly think someone in the Cecil hotel that was a worker was responsible for it. And I think it was the perfect crime and Amy Price covered it up. That's what I think. But we'll, we'll get into that more in a minute. So three days apart was when they changed like her topics on her like, you know, messy autopsy. Um, hide it, case closed. There's no public police files. Um, no one's gotten the police report. That's where the conspiracy started coming up. Construction, was it orchestrated? It makes you wonder. This reminded me, like, if you go back to the morbid thing for a minute, it reminded me of um, Columbine High School because I grew up really right down the street from Columbine. Um, Christian went to Columbine High School. I've talked about it several times. 
And uh, when Columbine happened, they banned Marilyn Manson's music and Eminem's music, not only from the state of Colorado, but I think it was nationwide. Eminem and Marilyn Manson were banned from coming to Colorado to perform for like 10 years. And, you know, I know Marilyn Manson's going through some other stuff. I don't want to talk, I know, rapey, whatever, abusive. I don't want to talk about that. I want to stay focused on critical thinking, which is comparing morbid to a witch hunt, just like at the time, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold shot up Columbine and they blamed it on Eminem and Marilyn Manson. It's the same thing. Um, it's the same as people saying, oh, you're a serial killer because you play video games. I play video games. Does that mean I'm going to be a serial killer? No, I'm not going to be a serial killer. I'm not going to be a sniper. Um, so it's just they're always trying to find an answer for something. And it's sad because you have this person like morbid Pablo Varga, Varga, Varga? Oh, I didn't pronounce it right. Um, his life gets like literally ruined before it. He said he was getting death threats and he tried to kill himself. He quit music. It's sad. It's just not right. Um, the forensic pathologist comes in and says, you don't have all the facts. You don't know what happened. Then release the reports, boo. Why aren't the reports public? Why can't anyone access any of the reports? Because they're all sloppy? Because it's LA County and it's known for being sloppy with everything they do? Corruption in the system, including corruption in the courts? I'm sorry, but like I live there, I know. It's so corrupted. The celebrities run, money runs there, period. They don't want LA to look bad. I mean, there's so much corruption. Why aren't they releasing the police report? Nobody knows. Not just the police report, the full extensive report. You can buy these reports online if they're not released and no one can access them. It's just not right. Now the sister steps in, says that she has had mental breakdowns before, says she's been hospi hospitalized for her diagnosis of bipolar one. She says that she's had psychotic episodes, she's had delusions, paranoia, hallucinations, and her sister confirms that she's been afraid of something and voices that she can't hear, which causes her to do weird things like hide under her bed. Um, now suddenly we're saying, that the hitch was left open, okay? Her clothes were off, so here's all the red flags. The hitch has changed several times. Um, you know, Amy Price went and cleaned up her room when she was considered a missing person. Her wallet was still in there, something's not right with that. Um, clothes were off with sand on them. We don't know that exactly still. The video has been edited. The other people did go onto the roof without a key and it didn't make an alarm and they went up there and said it was littered in trash and full of graffiti, which means residents from the hotel do go up there to smoke and do other things and party probably. Um, so they're saying like, oh no, you can't get to the roof. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Um, what was the sandy substance? I still want to know what that is. Women kill themselves without making a mess. That's like a known fact in psychology is when a woman wants to commit suicide, they're gonna do it in a way they don't leave a mess behind. A woman will not, will be very less likely to shoot herself because A, she doesn't wanna look like shit at her funeral and B, she doesn't wanna make a mess for other people to clean up because they're emotional beings. Now, a woman will be taking a pill of some sort to kill themselves or off themselves. Now, if you're talking about a psychiatric patient, yes, that could be different. I was so sick of hearing the detective give a hundred excuses why and how the video was edited. I didn't want to hear it anymore. Something's wrong and I don't agree with it. Um, now they have di they've diagnosed her with bipolar disorder one. The detective said it wasn't the hotel who edited it. It was um, someone like in, in the department that did it. He was upset because they did look around the tanks but they didn't search in the tanks and he feels like if he would have done that, he she would have been alive today. September 19th, 2013, a um, negligent suit is filed by Elise's parents against the hotel, saying that there was a wrongful death on the hotel's part. Um, accessible to, um, and the manager steps in and says, no, it wasn't our fault because no one has access to be able to get onto the roof. Um, and there's no locked on, on the lids of the tanks because there was no regulations at the time. Now this is when Santiago comes back on, who's the little Mexican worker. He reports that the hatch was now left open, so his story changed. Now if you watch that part of the episode, the producer in the background is speaking in Spanish as he asks him, was the water tank left open? Santiago goes, mm-hmm. And he looks down and almost frowns. So just reading body language, I think he was placed under an NDA. He was probably paid off and asked to lie so that the owners of the hotel didn't lose their property. So Los Angeles didn't look bad. Um, you can just tell he was totally lying and he's not good at it. PD calls it an honest mistake that he said that the lid was open or closed. An honest mistake, no it's not, it's not. I think he was telling the truth the first time. I think the lid was closed. 
And then he changed his story because the Cecil, they only, the story only changed when the lawsuit was filed. It's not right, guys. There's, there's so many messed up things with this case. It's not even funny. And the fact that an officer is giving an excuse saying it's just a, it's just a, a, a common mistake. No, it's not then you're not taking your job seriously and that's sickening considering you're the one that is supposed to be protecting us as citizens. I don't want you protecting me, that's for damn sure. Now, the producers ask Amy Price, you know, if you saw her acting erratically in places she shouldn't be within the hotel, do you think someone should have asked her if she was okay? Then Amy Price says, as a manager, how much should I do to help her? If I call 911, would they have come anyway because we're at Skid Row? What a dumb thing to say. You are responsible for the people in your hotel. It's not just the business that you're running. These are human lives, no matter what. And obviously if they call the Cecil, uh, if they call 911 one to three times a day for the Cecil, yes, they would have responded. You already said they did. Like, I just find her to be sickening. Honestly, I just find her to be um, extremely non-empathetic, no human emotion, robotic and she shouldn't be in this industry at all whatsoever. It's overwhelming for the police because of Skid Row, she says, blowing off all responsibility that she had any part in this. That's not the kind of manager I wanna be staying at her hotel. She needs to get out of public service work working under hotels 100%. So long story short, it was the judge rules that the hotel was at the right and the case was dismissed. Once again, definitely not wanting uh, national headlines that a international student from a different country came to Los Angeles and died because then we're gonna create fear and paranoia and it's gonna cause the tourism industry of Los Angeles to tank. What do I think? I think that the lid was off the tank. I think he, he was telling the truth the first time. Uh, people in the thing said you just need to take it as an accidental death and accept the fate. Morbid said that it's a portal to hell and verbatim he said you step in there and bad things will happen to you. Um, I may be another victim of that place in a different way. And I think he's right. Um, and the last few things that they have to say is the low income housing um, will stay. It'll become a fancy hotel on every other floor. One of the last things they said was they're gonna put a bar on the roof and they're going to put a pool on the roof. A girl died up there very tragically and they just have no empathy for it. I don't think I'd wanna go to a rooftop pool knowing Eliza died that night alone. And like they said, taking her last steps. It's just really sad. It's sickening and it's sad. Now they say they need to clean up Skid Row. How many other Elizas have we missed? And um, was it due to her depression? So I want the last thing I want to talk about is um, her bipolar diagnosis. Oftentimes they reported her uh, Tumblr account saying things like she was depressed. She couldn't get out of bed for days. She was diagnosed with bipolar one. That is not bipolar one. I actually consulted. Um, who I used to live with that has bipolar one. And uh, he agreed with me that if she talks about depression that much, she probably doesn't have mania phases. Now, the difference between bipolar one and bipolar two is bipolar one, you have severe manic episodes and short-lived depressive episodes. Um, bipolar two is you will have severe depressive episodes where you're in bed for days, weeks, maybe months, which sounds like that was Eliza, and short sporadic bursts of manic episodes. Now, with that being said, I think she was misdiagnosed. I think she should have been diagnosed with bipolar 2 rather than bipolar 1, just from her Tumblr feed and her talking honestly about the depression. In the video, the question was if she had low levels of her antidepressants, antipsychotics, and mood stabilizers in her system, um, would it cause her to hallucinate and act the way that she was acting? And my answer is no and I consulted the person I used to live with who watched the video with me, and even on low doses of medication, agrees that that is not how you would act if you were manic or in a psychotic episode. I don't like how the media and people, like in this documentary, are so free to talk about mental health when they've probably never witnessed it or experienced it. Now I know that the African American lady towards the end was saying yes, it was clearly a psychotic episode. I don't know, I think she was like a doctor or something. Have you seen one? Because I've seen full blown manic episodes and that was not a manic episode. She was slightly hallucinating, yes. That would be, I would consider it more of a hallucination but you don't really get hallucinations in manic episodes. When a manic episode happens, 
you get like a high on life. You are invincible. It's an adrenaline rush. You become hypersexual, which means you'll sleep with anybody and anything that comes in front of you. You have so much adrenaline, you need to get rid of it by just sleeping with people and having sex. You spend a lot of money. Like anything that brings you adrenaline, you drive fast. You know, you do like really risky behaviors. Are you walking around hotels with your hands clenched out strangely? No, you are not. So therefore, do I think it was a manic episode? No, I do not. I think do I think it was a manic episode? No, I do not. I do I think it was a manic episode? No, I do not. I do I think it was a manic episode? No, I do not. I think she was afraid. I do think she was in a delicate mental state. I do think I have said this for years that when you're in a delicate delicate mental state, you should never stay in a haunted location ever. You become very susceptible. I feel like energies see you as a vessel that they can enter. And you may not know that you're accidentally willingly um, allowing them to enter you. I do think she was experiencing paranormal activity. I do think people were watching her. Um, especially if she's wandering the hotel like they said they are. Who knows what the staff is up to? It's a sketch ass place. I think Amy Price stepped in, knew what happened. I think the video was edited. I think there was a foot in the hallway. I think she was trying to hide from someone in the elevator. Accidentally pressed the wrong button. Do I think she was playing the elevator game? No. I don't think she was playing the elevator game. I think she was trying to get away from him and she was panicked and she may be having issues because of her medication levels. I do not think she was bipolar one. I think she was bipolar two. What do I think happened to her? There's a couple of options we could go with. One, there was a human that was involved and whether she was hurt in some way and in some capacity, it didn't show up on the autopsy. They carried her up to the water tank, maybe knocked her out somehow and she ended up drowning in the water tank. We don't really know, but is it possible? She was a tiny little Chinese girl. Yes, it's possible for that to happen. She wasn't some big girl that someone couldn't carry up a ladder. It would be possible, okay? To say it's impossible is ridiculous. Now, what, what could have else happened if she was responsible? That was if the lid was left um, closed, okay? Because she wouldn't have been able to close the lid herself. Hypothetically, which I don't believe the lid was left open, but let's say for, you know, devil's advocate's sake, the lid was left open, how did she get in there? Yes, then I do. Yes, then I do. Yes, then I do. Yes, then I do think she probably did commit suicide by accident. I think she was in a fragile state of mind and I do believe it could be related to paranormal activity. Maybe something lured her in. Much like when Zach had his episode on ghost adventures, the two psychics said, I'm not sure if it was human or not human, but that was what killed her. So that there's two theories. That depends on if you believe if the lid was open or if the lid was closed. Do I think she was in a state of mania? No. Do I think she had fragile mental health and she shouldn't have been staying in there and possibly experiencing paranormal activity? 100%. Do I think that there's a lot of people involved that were trying to cover something up? For sure. I don't like the coroner's attitude. I definitely don't trust Amy Price. I think the police are corrupt and I just think it was a perfect murder is what I think happened and rest her soul bless her and rest her soul what do you guys think to happen to Eliza Lamb I'd love to hear your feedback in the comments below please give my video a thumbs up please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already make sure you're following us on social media and as always I will catch you guys next time back from the dead